Hello and welcome to the New World Review, your source for everything anime and manga. And today it's time for more of my ever beloved Hunter x Hunter. And quite specifically, we are going to delve into the question of who will win the Succession War. Now, if you're not on top of the Succession War as it currently stands, look, I don't blame you because it has been almost a year since a new chapter has been published. And even if you were completely up to date, it's a pretty dense arc thus far. But I do have a quick Succession War recap available, which briefly covers all of the princes amongst other things. And that might give you some good preparation for this video. Because our task today is to examine who has the best chance of actually coming out on top. And to do this, we'll be examining the princes by tiers, beginning with who I believe have no chance of winning whatsoever, followed by those with, you know, a maybe chance of winning. And finally, we'll cover the cream of the crop with the front runners to take this entire contest. Now to begin, let's actually address an even lower tier, which are the princes who, barring some sort of incredible resurrection Nen BS, have already been removed from the running due to their unfortunate and gruesome demise. Princes that fall into this category are 12th Prince Momoze, who was brutally strangled by an assailant after she had become exhausted exhausted, invoking the powers of her Nen Beast. Shortly after, 10th Prince Kacho met her end by attempting to escape from the battlegrounds. Although the exact nature of her death is still rather mysterious, I guess it has something to do with lots of scary hands and such. Either way, she's gone. Well, sort of. I mean, her Nen Beast is currently impersonating her, but we're not going to be uh, considering that. And finally, 8th Prince Salasala was assassinated by one of 1st Prince Benjamin's bodyguards, and the way his corpse was found very much mimics the way Salasala chose to live, which was entirely naked in a pool of his own filth. But that's it for that. These are the three princes that are definitely not going to win. May they rest in peace, or if they were particularly awful people, then may they rest in torment or whatever. Moving on though, I would like to now present you with the four princes who are highly unlikely to win, which are Mariam, Tebepa, Tyson, and Fugetsu. Starting with 13th Prince Mariam, this little guy is in a pretty rough spot. He is both a child and one of the lowest ranking princes within the empire, meaning that he does not possess the personal strength, experience, or resources to be a proper competing force in the war. He does have a couple of decent factors going for him, of course, one of which is obviously an end beast, although every other prince also has an end beast, so that would cancel that factor out at best, and in fact at worst, Mariam is probably even at a great disadvantage because of it, because the other older princes would likely be wielding their beast powers in much more efficient ways than he is able to. But Mariam does also have both Bisky and Hanzo currently serving as his bodyguards, and that certainly is not power to scoff at. They're both incredibly profound figures within the Hunter Hunter world, but I don't think they're enough to keep Mariam safe at all costs. So to be honest, of all of the remaining princes, I think Mariam is in the worst possible situation, and while killing children, you know, it's pretty dark, it's certainly not beyond Togashi to invoke. Plus, even in a situation where the war ends and Mariam is somehow magically alive, he is not going to be the winner. And look, maybe this will be the biggest plot twist in history, and I'm going to look like quite the fool 10 decades down the road when this arc finally concludes. But as of right now, I'm sorry, my boy, but you've got no chance. Similarly, I honestly don't think the fifth prince to Beppa has a great chance of winning here. Now I do want to be clear, she has a better chance than Mariam, but at the same time, I think all of the remaining princes do, so that doesn't mean too much. The main thing that really worries me about to Beppa is that her Nen Beast seems like a very squishy existence. Like it does seem to contain some very nice power in regards to synthesizing various compounds, which to Beppa is in a great position to wield, being a science goddess and all. However, her beast is also very, very timid, which on the one hand is great because it would signal that the beast is very careful, but it also likely implies that if the beast was caught in a singular bad situation, then it would be very unlikely to come out of said situation in a good way. By which I mean, it's a goner. Now some evidence that may be in her favor is that she appears to have made a temporary alliance with fourth Prince Radnik, but I honestly believe that that makes her situation far, far worse, because that man is not to be trusted under any circumstances. And even if he could be trusted in this specific situation, allowing Radnik to outlive the first three princes would practically ensure sure to Beppa's death anyway, because with them gone, there is going to be almost nobody who could stand in his way. So to Beppa's path to victory is an extremely cautious one. She is a contender who cannot afford to make a single mistake, and as intelligent as she is, there are too many variables at play here, with 11 other princes each plotting and scheming for absolutely no mistakes to be made. And that makes her beast, and therefore her, highly, highly vulnerable. Going down the line, we have the immediate consecutive prince being sixth prince Tyson. Now Tyson has an incredibly powerful Nen Beast that has essentially turned her into a cult leader who dreams of reshaping the world in her own image. So Tyson's Nen Beast ability kind of follows Salasala's in that it essentially converts people into thinking of her favorably, although via a completely different mechanism. And you know, that didn't work out very well for Salasala, being 
dead and all, but I do have to say that Tyson is a much more proficient wielder of the power. The big issue is that Tyson, unlike most cult leaders, seems to genuinely believe her own words, that love can change the world, and that she will oppose any form of violent action. Now that obviously means that Tyson's chances of winning become much more difficult, because it would take an absolutely incredible series of lucky events for her to win by doing nothing. And yeah, I know she's not, strictly speaking, doing nothing. She is converting people and building a legion, but she is still a passive player, and I just can't see her finding a path to victory in this field of contenders. And finally, for the incredibly unlikely to win tier, we have 11th Prince Fugetsu. Now, I will start off by saying that Fugetsu has unknowingly inherited quite an incredible power and essentially has two Nen beasts on her side at the moment, one of which is the door and the other which is the late 10th Prince Kacho's beast, which has assumed her form. And this is very important because Fugetsu's beast can only be fully utilized in concert with Kacho and what it does is it basically allows them to travel anywhere they want within the bounds of the battlefield. So of all the contenders in this tier, Fugetsu is definitely the one who is going to be by far the hardest to actually kill because her mobility is second to none. However, the problem is that Fugetsu is more or less a normal teenage girl. Very kind, very timid, and very soft-hearted. She has no place in this contest. All she can really do is run until either she or Kacho's Nen Beast gets caught. Not who I'd be putting my money on, because like Tyson, there would need to be an incomparable series of lucky events for Fugetsu to win whilst doing nothing but hiding. But with that tier out of the way, we can move on to the next batch of candidates, which actually have a chance of winning, not the best chance in my mind, but a chance nonetheless. And they consist of Zhang Lei, Luzurus, Camilla, and Benjamin. Now, third Prince Zhang Lei is in quite an interesting spot. I would definitely say that he's probably not in anybody's personal legitimate favorites to win, and I definitely question his ability to remain in this war for the long run. And my main reason for thinking that he has a maybe not so great chance of coming out of this victoriously has entirely to do with his Nen Beast. And while we don't know anything except speculation regarding it at this very moment, speculation in Hunter Hunter can be incredibly influential because the beast is modeled after Zhang Lei's thoughts, personality, desires, essentially everything that makes him him. So when Zhang Lei speculates about a beast modeled after himself, well then that all of a sudden becomes pretty meaningful. And Zhang Lei's current theory is that the power of his Nen Beast will kick into true gear after the war has ended. And he's had the opportunity to spread the coins it generates throughout his kingdom, which is super cool and all, but if that is the case, then it's going to be less than helpful in a war with some pretty insane Nen Beast powers that he'll be going up against. However, in Zhang Lei's defense, he does have the resources and intelligence to do quite well, especially since he has an alliance with one of the three great mafia powers of the Kakin Underworld, and and that is what keeps him in the maybe tier. The fact that he does have manpower and the wisdom to put it to good use. So even in the situation where his Nen Beast is entirely useless during the contest, which I don't think it will be, but let's say that it is for argument's sake, I can't deny that he could still potentially maybe pull this off. Next up is Seventh Prince Luzerus, and this may garner a weird response at first, because it really doesn't seem like he should be up here with the first three princes of the Kharkin Empire. However, there is almost certainly a hell of a lot more than meets the eye with this man. So just like Zhang Lei, Luzerus is also a benefactor of one of the three great mafia powers within the Kharkin underworld, and that should not be underestimated because one, manpower is always great, and two, because it shows a very shady and deceptive side to Luzerus that has not been made apparent in any of his appearances thus far. To add to this, Luzerus's Nen B seem to be entirely based on the concept of deception and is able to conjure whatever a person desires to lure them into a trap of some sort. So I would honestly put Luzerus in a similar role as Zhang Lei, intelligent and powerful. And to add on to that, Luzerus certainly has an end beast that can actually help in the contest. So if left unchecked, I think Luzerus could present quite a danger to the others. Not enough to be considered a front runner, but definitely enough to be a dark horse. Moving along, we have second Prince Camilla, and this might shock some of you to have her being so far down in the rankings because she does seem to have an exceptional combination of power. To begin, Camilla is already a Nen user and has even developed her own Hatsu, which takes the form of a big old kitty cat that absorbs the life force of those that kill Camilla. And to add to that, her guardian Nen beast has the power to take control of people. So this right here is a potentially overpowered combination in that Camilla could theoretically force people to kill her and then have them die instead of her. What I find tricky about Camilla though, is that death is an activation requirement for her Hatsu. So for argument's sake, all you'd really need to do to defeat Camilla is keep her alive, but maybe heavily injured or sedated. I also think that such a powerful ability is bound to come with more restrictions or conditions that haven't been literally conveyed to us yet. For example, it has been implied that Camilla may need to be in a state of Zetsu upon her death in order for her Hatsu to activate. In which case she would not be able to have her Nen Beast materialized, which takes away the idea of her controlling people. But another factor is that Camilla also 
doesn't seem very keen to be using her guardian beast in the first place. And it would appear that she is putting all of her stock into her existing Nen talents, which is kind of arrogant and she's also very, very aggressive in terms of putting herself in danger due to the safety net that she believes her Hatsu is. So all in all, Camilla seems like a very risky individual and her abilities and personality are kind of ill-fitting for a contest like this. And now we have first Prince Benjamin, who is quite possibly one of the most threatening singular individuals in the entire arc. In terms of everything to do with raw power, this guy has it. And just like Camilla, he comes into this war as a Nen user, with another pretty crazy ability known as Benjamin Baton. And essentially with this, Benjamin is able to inherit the Nen abilities of soldiers who are part of his private army. And as of right now, he is the proud user of three separate Nen abilities as a result. Now at the moment, we're not clear on whether or not there is a limit to the number of Hatsu that can come under his command. But even if there is, and even if that limit is quite low, this is still pretty insane. Because it gives him a whole range of versatility before his own guardian beast even comes into the mix. Plus, as stated before, he has control of his own private army. So in terms of pure power, this is the guy to beat. And I think that he will be a serious and destructive force going forward. My issue with Benjamin is that I don't think that he is well placed mentally to become the true victor of this war. I mean, yes, he is a sharp military tactician, but he is exceptionally and easily moved to anger and aggression. And I believe that a man like him could be quite easily played by any of our three remaining candidates. Speaking of, we're finally here. These are the three princes that I believe have nothing short of a spectacular chance of winning this contest and becoming the next king of the Kakin Empire. And those three princes are Hawkenberg, Sarajnik, and just stay with me here, Wobel. Starting with Ninth Prince Hawkenberg though, in him we have a true revolutionary and an honorable human being. Initially, he entered the war with a pacifist attitude, refusing to commit bloodshed, and if that was still the case, then I certainly would not be placing him in this tier. But as time went on, Hawkenberg's resolve became firm to the point where he was even willing to kill his own father in order to stop the succession war, and later on, he even committed himself to winning the contest in the hopes of forever changing the Karkin Empire. Now, Hawkenberg's inner strength, I would say, is unequaled amongst the entirety of the Karkin royalty and that is reflected in his Nen Beast, which not only makes Hawkenberg more powerful, but also his loyal followers, thus putting him in a position to muster a truly incomparable force. And in fact, it has already been speculated that Hawkenberg's newly acquired power could potentially wipe out First Prince Benjamin's entire faction, which is a pretty big call to make, but it was made by one of the soldiers of Benjamin's own army, so I do trust that judgment. But Hawkenberg is a true contender because he is a pure believer, kind of like Tyson, except that Hawkenberg inspires his loyalty naturally, but also, he has the will to actually fight for the future that he believes in. Weirdly enough, Hawkenberg has a poor relationship with his entire family, except for fourth Prince Sarajnik. And I find that incredibly strange because the two are just such polar opposites in terms of personality. But this positive relationship may be Hawkenberg's one major weakness, because if he hesitates even for a second when confronting Sarajnik, then that could very easily spell his doom. Speaking of, let's examine 4th Prince Sarajnik, and I think if you took a poll of favourites to win this contest, he'd quite comfortably come out on top. And for very good reason, because he's one of the most gifted individuals that Hunter x Hunter has ever produced, with a rapidly growing and downright sinister mastery of Nen. And just for one example of that, Sarajnik is the kind of man who is capable of subconsciously summoning a second Nen beast, which is ridiculous, but he has also developed a Hatsu that, in a rather complicated manner, gives him access to a form of future sight. Not only that, but Sarajnik is more than intelligent enough to wield that that power to great effect, making him by far the most dangerous individual in the contest from the perspective of Nen. But Sarajnik, like his two brothers, is also a mafia benefactor, and so commands a very sizable underworld power. And you know, while Sarajnik might not have the sheer drive to win that Hawkenberg has, he does possess the lust to slaughter his siblings, which is also a very compelling force to be feared. And all in all, I don't see any weaknesses for Sarajnik right now. In terms of personality or power, there's just no opening. And to be perfectly frank, every second that this man is allowed to live makes him an infinitely more difficult obstacle to overcome. A very strong contender indeed. And finally, for our top tier candidates, May I present 14th Prince Wobel. So you might be thinking that Wobel does not belong here or indeed anywhere near here. I mean, she's a baby. She has the least resources available for her of any of the princes. And as far as we are aware, her Nen Beast has not even manifested yet. Sounds like Wobel's in a pretty bad situation. The thing is though, Wobel has something going for her that could single-handedly decide the outcome of this entire war. And that is Karapika. 
This man is far more valuable than any Nen Beast or Hatsu. Karapika's intelligence is through the roof. In fact, he may well be one of the smartest characters in this entire world. And he can back that up with phenomenal Nen usage as a natural conjurer with the option to become a specialist. I wholeheartedly believe that Karapika could do anything that he sets his mind to. And if that job is to protect Werble, then that's what's going to happen. And really, if anybody can overcome the natural genius of Saradnik, it's definitely Karapika. And furthermore, Karapika also has a vendetta against Saradnik as he is the owner of the last remaining batch of Scarlet Eyes, which means that our blonde protagonist is going to have his sights set on taking out the prime candidate to win. And remember what I said earlier, whatever Karapika says his mind to, well, it's as good as done. That and that alone is why I believe that Werble is a prime candidate to win the Succession War. And that pretty much does it for this discussion on who will win the Succession War. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, then please do consider donating to the New World Review Patreon, because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if Patreon isn't quite your style, then please do leave this video a like, share, or subscribe, because it also helps support this channel an incredible amount. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server, where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on who will win the Succession War. This has been the New World Review, and I'll see you next time.